We are continuing on the subject of uh, doing and being, and we're looking at this great concept, trying to clear up the uh, confusions that might arise in our minds uh, that are due to uh, uh, an injecting of a new thought into our thought process. And sometimes we end up in a uh, confusion, and we don't want to confuse anybody, but we are wanting to reveal the Word of God, and we are wanting the truth of the Holy Spirit to be spoken to us right to his mind and right to his own lips, to our very hearts, that we might grasp the reality of the truth of the kingdom. And we're discovering that the truth of the kingdom is really in its depth, is found in the reality of the being concept. That there is a doing, we understand a doing, but what we mean by doing in our language is self-sourcing. And we're not into self-sourcing, this issue of being and doing is really about sourcing. Being is me, means that not that I'm inactive, not that there is no activity at all, not that I'm lazy, not that I'm laid back, not that I do nothing. Do nothingism is not an option in being. It has to do with source. What sources the doing within you? What is the flow of that doing? Uh, how, what, what, what is the activity itself? How does it spill through you? What brings it to pass? What motivates it? What is the nature of it? That's the issue. Now, you know that in our language, doing, of course, is focused on self-doing. When I stand and say, I do, I did, I've done, it's all about me. It's all about who I am. It's all about what I've accomplished. It's all about what I am. It's all about faith in myself. But when we talk about being, we're talking about a shift in source that can only come about by that tremendous movement of God himself. God himself has to do this within us. We never can pull this off by our own doing. God himself is going to have to come and in doing something within us that we cannot do for ourselves, we find ourselves being sourced by God, a new nature, the flow of his life, spontaneously spilling through us, bringing about that which we have longed for in our own spiritual beings. God has come to dwell within man and to source man. We are being in him, being, doing. It's all about source. Now we want to continue in trying to give expression to this. We're constantly trying to discover new language. Language that will help clarify. Language that will help express what this doing and this being is all about as we compare them. One of the great places to discover this concept is in the realm of the cross itself. So I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 is filled with the cross of Christ. Actually, it starts in chapter 26 as he moves into the final days of his ministry and life. He's in the upper room. The Garden of Gethsemane takes place. And as you move into chapter 27, you're coming out of the uh, time when he was at Caiaphas' palace. They stuck him in a little room. They're bringing him now down the stairway. They've mutilated him. His face is mutilated. His beard is dangling by its roots. His hair is filled with dried blood. His hands are tied behind his back. They're bringing him down the stairway. They're going to take him down to Pilate's palace and get this over with. It's, a, it's at the crack of dawn. They want to get this accomplished before the crowds get up and begin to stir around because the crowds, they have some fear of them. You see, that's the group that was waving palm branches on Palm Sunday. They love this miracle worker. So they want to get this over with. Judas is standing in the background, and he is seeing all of this, and enters into great remorse, great overwhelming sense of I've done wrong, and tries to undo the whole thing. But of course, they will not tolerate that. They drag Jesus down to Pilate's palace. The trials take place. The religious trials, the secular trials, they're taking place. The end result is, he's going to be crucified. And this whole chapter, it's a long chapter. It goes clear down to, chapter, uh, to verse 66. And what a significant chapter it is in relationship to our own lives. Jesus is being crucified. In this, in this chapter, we are experiencing contrast. It's amazing what Matthew does in his writing as he prepares to explain the crucifixion to us. He does it in this contrasting manner. That's an excellent way of teaching, you understand. Play, painting one picture on this side, and then painting another picture on this side, 
and contrasting the two and somehow in the contrast finding the reality of truth that we really need and really affects our lives. Now where there is a contrast in this passage, well there's many of them, but as you begin to work your way through them, you see that there is an underlying contrast. It's, it's, it's very significant. We haven't called it in the past being and doing, but the language is not what really matters. What really matters and what we're really after is the concept. See, I've discovered many people can give us the words of holiness, but they haven't grasped the concept. They haven't grasped the reality of it. What it is at the heart itself, what the being is at the very essence, that's what I am, am, am interested for you to grasp. That's what I want you to know. The heart of the concept. If you can get the heart of the concept, then it won't matter what words we use. Hey, you'll see it. It'll be there. And we can use a variety of words. And, of course, what happens in the church world is we end up developing buzzwords. And when you say these certain words, oh, people get blessed. But they don't really get the concept. Because if you use other words other than the buzzwords, they don't understand. They don't get it. They're not turned on. They don't get blessed. It's because it isn't the concept that blesses them. It's the buzzwords. So we're not interested in buzzwords. We talk about cross style. It's become a phrase we use all the time. But it's just another word for a concept of holiness and the being and the internal life of God literally living his life through you. So we're always working on this, this language uh, factor that pays a great part in communication. Now when you come to the contrast, the contrasts are very interesting. And I want you to uh, turn in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 27. Of course, he's on the cross by this time. They've got the sign up above in verse 37. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. You'll note that there. And then as you come on down, there's a mockery that takes place, given by the leadership of Israel. And as you move on, you see that there's darkness that covers the face of the earth. And it's verse 45. And Jesus is crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he's entering into the death experience. In fact, in verse 50, that Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. What a significant statement. Several things happened out of that. That's where you get into the contrast. One thing that happened out of that was verse 51. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Second thing that happened was verse 52. The graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into a holy city and appeared to many. But there's something else that took place. It's verse 54. It begins the contrast. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things which had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Contrast. Now the contrast is basically this. Over on this side, Matthew says, I want to paint the picture of those who are the most likely to succeed. The ones who are the most likely to succeed. Oh, they'll get in. They got everything going for them. Hey, everything's falling in place. They're running the race. They're halfway finished already. Hey, they're going down the pathway. They've made the hill. It's downhill all the way. If they trip and fall, they'd roll in by this, the, uh, 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 this time. There's, there's no chance they won't make it, you see. They're, they're the most likely to succeed. But contrasted with that, over on this side, he says, I want to paint the picture of the ones who are the least likely to succeed. Oh, they don't have a chance. There is no way they're going to get in. I mean, they're running in the wrong direction in the race. That's how bad it is. I mean, there's no way. There, there's no chance at all. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the insight. There's, there's no way they're going to cross the finish line and make it in the race. They're out. Now, the interesting thing about the contrast is this. Over on this side, the ones who are the least likely, the, the, the most likely to succeed, oh, they'll get in. They're already to, about to cross, the, cross li the, the finish line. They'll make it for sure. But the interesting thing is, they don't. Over here, the interesting thing is, they're the least likely to succeed. There's no chance. They are, they're running in the wrong direction. But guess what? They do succeed. They do get in. That's the startling contrast of the passage. Now, 
he starts out in verse 54, the verse we read. It says, let me start with this contrast. Now, we're only going to just mention this contrast just to give you the flow of the passage. But he starts out by talking about the Jews. Oh, they're all over the chapter, you realize. They're the most likely to succeed. I mean, buy into the Messiah? Well, sure. They've been looking for the Messiah all of their life. How could they miss it? Well, hey, there's no way Jesus is going to show up in all of his greatness and bring about a redemption for Israel and, and the world to come, and, and, and they aren't going to buy into it? Come on. They've got the prophets. They've got the Old Testament. They've got prophets yelling in their faces. Hey, they've got the synagogue, the temple. They've got the written law of God. They've got everything they need. They made sacrifice after sacrifice. Hey, they've offered the sacrifice sacrifice lambs, there's no way the Messiah's, could. they get up every morning and say, could this be the day? Meaning, could this be the day the Messiah comes? They're looking for him. They've got all the background. There's no way he's going to show up and they're not going to see him. How could they miss him? But they do miss him. They miss him. He blows up. They end up nailing him to a cross. There's no recognition of him. They totally, they're the most likely to succeed, but they totally, absolutely miss him. What a tragedy. Now over on this side, Matthew says, I want to talk to you about the one who's the least likely to succeed. Now this is the Roman centurion, representing, of course, the Roman political system. I mean, there's absolutely no way he's going to get in. <laughs> Come on. There's not a chance. He's a Roman barbarian. You know what this guy does? He kills people. He lives by the sword. He's got the taste of blood in his mouth. There's no way he's going to buy into this. He's got no background. He's got no religious background. Do you realize he believes in many gods? Come on, have you ever been to a Roman centurion party? Have you ever been to one of theirs? Oh, come on, you don't want to go. It's filthy. There's no way, come on, this guy is not going to get in. But he does. Isn't it startling? At the cross, something so significant takes place that it literally moves the heart of the centurion and those who were guarding Jesus. And the next thing you know, they're saying, truly, this is the Son of God. We have missed it. We are buying in. This is the deal. Hey, we are recognizing him. What a significant contrast. Now, we want to go to another, the, the second contrast, another contrast. It's what we want to talk about. It especially deals with the issue of being, doing, different language, but all oh, same concept. Now over here there are the most likely to succeed. Who would they be? Again, Jews, only not just the Jews we talked about earlier. These are the disciple Jews. These are the guys, oh come on, these guys will get in. The disciples, hey, they are especially picked out by God. It's amazing. Jesus prayed all night and got their names. There, there's no way that they won't get in. I mean, he selected them, handpicked by God. They've had special on-the-job training, day after day after day, had the front row of the Sermon on the Mount. These guys taught him to pray. These guys, hey, everything, they received the power of the Spirit within, went out and did phenomenal miracles, came back, demons come under their control. These guys have abilities. These guys have insight. These guys have interpretation of the parables at the midnight hours. These guys walked with Jesus intimately for three solid years. There is no way. They've had training on the cross. Jesus took six months of his life, set it aside just to drill them, train them, get them ready for the crucifixion. He's told them about it. They were in on the three predictions of his death and resurrection. There is no way they're not going to buy into this thing. They're going to be right there by the cross. They'll be supportive. They'll be right there standing by his side all the way. But they aren't. They miss it. Garden of Gethsemane. They couldn't even stay awake while he was praying. Garden of Gethsemane. Hey, they scattered and like rats, man, when the soldiers came came along and took Jesus. They were they were he was alone. They didn't stay by his side. They they didn't they didn't rest in his presence. They weren't there. They missed it. And how do we know they missed it? Well, it's so easy to spot. 
See, if they'd have bought in, if there would have been one single one of them that had bought in, he wouldn't have gone to the Caiaphas palace in the mock trial by himself. And when all the lies were being told, and all the stuff was going down, man, and they were building a case against him, where is the disciple that was standing by his side saying, hey, I was there. This is not the way it went down. This is not the way it happened. I can tell you the truth. Where was the one that stood by his side and gave testimony? There wasn't one. Where were they? They didn't buy in. Here at the crucifixion, which one was by the cross? Yeah, John came for a little while and, and the mother thing happened. But hey, when it came right down to it, hey, if, they, if they'd have really bought in, if they'd have really bought in, do you know what would have taken place? There would have been three crosses on that hill. There'd have been 15, man. They'd have joined him in his death if they'd have really bought in. But they didn't. Hey, they missed it. They missed it. They missed it. They are the most likely to succeed. But they didn't get it. Now over here on this side is the least likely to succeed. Not a chance. There's no way. Come on. This, I mean, it's foolish to even talk about. It's given to us in verse 55. Now don't read ahead on me. Just look carefully at the beginning word. And. Now that word in the Greek can literally be translated moreover or in addition to. In other words, it sets up the contrast again. Over on this side, the least likely to succeed, the most likely to succeed, namely uh, the disciples. Hey, they'll get in. They've got all the training, everything they need, the Jewish male disciple. They'll surely make it. Over here on this side, least likely to succeed in addition to that. Or, see, he's just given us one contrast. The contrast of the Jews, the Jewish religious system over against the Roman political system. Now he says, if you think that was something, if you looked at that and just shook your head and said, how could it be? Man, when I give you this one, in addition to that contrast, I want to give you a second contrast. This will make you slap your knee. <laughs> this will make you laugh right out loud. This will make you take the palm of your hand and strike yourself on the forehead. This will cause you to say, what? How on earth could this possibly be? Now, this second contrast again is, over here, the most likely to succeed, Jewish male disciple. He's got everything going for him. Jesus has trained him, but he's not there. Now, look at what's over on this side, the least likely to succeed. And in verse 55, it says, and many women. Isn't that hilarious? Many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him where they're looking on from afar. <laughs> hey, they're the least likely to, the women, oh, come on. Hey, they're not, not a chance. They've had no training. There is no way they're going to, I mean, they, they weren't there at the, at the Sermon on the Mount. They, hey, they didn't receive the power of God and go out and do great miracles. Hey, this, this crowd, the women, oh, forevermore. They're uneducated. They haven't got a chance. There is no way they weren't called. They, hey, Jesus didn't get their names. Hey, there's no way they're going to, there's absolutely, but they do. In spite of everything that's against them, in spite of their culture, in spite of the barriers that are between them and the male, Jewish male disciples, guess what? They get in. They are there. They saw it. They bought in. They are there at the cross when the disciples were not. Phenomenal truth. Now, to really get a hold of this contrast and the depth of this truth, you really need to see and understand the position of the woman in the culture of Jesus' day. You understand it was a male-dominated society. Well, you say it's always been a male-dominated society. That's not true. No, no. Every culture you want to investigate, you find it's a male-dominated society. <laughs> That's not true. Well, when wasn't it, when, when hasn't it been a male-dominated society? Oh, that's easy. Creation. It's interesting that when God made man and woman, he made them equal. He didn't make the male dominant over the female or the female dominant over the male. He made them equal. In fact, as you get into the creation story, you begin to discover that God made male and then he formed female out of the rib of the male. And he, did, he gave both of them, 
he gave, get this, he gave both of them authority over the garden. Equal authority. See, God did not make man in his image, and then the male, or the, or the female, in the image of the male that was made in the image of God. That isn't the way it went. See, God made man in his image, God made female in his image, and they were both created equal. God gave both of them high position of ruling over, together, over the garden, and made them equal. Well, you say that may be true, but after all, the man was really made first. I mean, he was first, so obviously he's first in the line. Yeah, you really don't want to go there. Hey, you're going to break your leg and we're going to shoot you. You just really don't want to go there. No, the man was made first. Yeah, that is true. Man was made first. But God looked at him when he got done and said, the boy needs help. He needs lots of help. So I'm going to make him a helper equal to him. Now this helper was not subordinate to him, inferior to him, but equal to him. Uh, this was the creation of God. Well, you may say, well, that's fine. Uh, but still, she was just a helper. Don't forget that. She was just a helper. Hey, God made male and then made a helper and she was just the helper. You really don't want to bring that up. No, I'm telling you, preacher. Hey, he, he, uh, she was just a helper. Okay. If you go to the book of Psalms, verse uh, chapter 33, you'll discover the word helper shows up again. Only this time it's in re reference to God Jehovah. God Jehovah is reigning. And you know how, and of course there's puny Israel. Israel is doing her thing and Israel is operating. But wait a minute. This passage refers to sovereign God Jehovah as a helper to Israel who really didn't have it together. Now, take that back and bring it into our passage in the Genesis account as we're discussing it. What you discover is that God made female a helper to the male who would, if you take it in the, hey, we, you just shouldn't have gone there. So God made male and female and made them equal. Well, where did all of this male domination come from? Oh, come on. We understand where it came from. It came from self-centered carnality, the essence of sin. Hey, who's going to win on this? Here's a woman who says, I'm going to do my thing. I want to have my own way. Here's a man who says, no, I'm going to have my own way. I'm going to do my own thing. Now, who's going to win on that? Well, the one with the biggest muscles. So obviously, it ended up being a male-dominated society. And it has been that way, but it's only because of sin that it turned out that way. Now, by the time you get down to Jesus' day, what you discover is that the woman was a tool, an instrument, uneducated, was not allowed or permitted to be educated, was not expected to be educated. She was a tool, again, an instrument to be used for the male. In fact, a Jew would get up every morning. Here was his prayer. When he got up in the morning, he would pray, Oh, Father, oh, God, great Jehovah, I thank you that I was not born a Gentile, nor a woman. That was his prayer. See, the woman was low level. The woman had no position. The woman couldn't be a disciple. I mean, the woman, hey, no, she isn't going to fit in. The woman, hey, the women, they're just not, there's no way. They are the least likely to succeed. And yet here they are. Isn't it interesting? They were the ones that were at the cross. With all of their supposed inferiority and all of their lack of knowledge and all of their lack of training, somehow all they got was the leftovers. All they did was hang around and pick up what they could overhear all that time. But man, when it came right down to it, you know what happened? They got it. Something happened in their lives, man. They caught the vision. They saw what he was all about. They had fallen in love with the Christ. He had captured them. And there they were at the cross. Well, what were they doing at the cross? Now, listen to the passage. Look at it carefully. Verse 55. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Now back up and see what they were doing. Verse 55. Many women 
who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there, looking on from afar. What, what, were, what were they doing at the cross? Well, they were just there. They were there. Now, the grammar structure there indicates, the Greek verb indicates that there was a continuous action to this. In other words, it wasn't just they showed up and left. It was they were continually there. Now, we don't know, according to the passage, how long they were there. But it's not hard to guess. See, they weren't doing anything. Hey, they were far off. They couldn't get close. The soldiers wouldn't let them. Hey, they were not permitted. Uh, they couldn't get involved in this thing. They weren't doing anything spectacular. There was no deliverance taking place. They weren't getting up some kind of a, 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 a an attempt to overtake and throw the Roman government aside and take Jesus down from the cross. Nothing like that was going on. They were just there, focused in. They were just they were just staring at him. They were just empathy and sympathy and something was going and when Jesus through those eyes that had literally been beaten and mutilated in his face until it was swollen and his eyes swollen shut and he could hardly see and when he'd open up his eyes and see this through the squinted eyes he'd see a friendly face out there it was these women they they were pulling for him hey they were there they they weren't doing anything they weren't doing anything they were just there they were just focused they were just into it. They were just, oh, pulling for him, empathy and sympathy, and they were just there. Now, again, we don't know how long they were there, but it's not hard to figure out what happened. Hey, the disciples were at the Garden of Gethsemane in the middle, in, in the night hours. Jesus prayed maybe from midnight, uh, 11 o'clock midnight, on up until 2 and 3 in the morning. And then along came, the, uh, along came the soldiers and got him. The disciples scattered like rats. They went everywhere. And, I, and one of them no doubt went by where the ladies were staying, banged on the door and said, Oh, they've got him. They've got him. They've got him. The disciples, they've scattered. They're not there. Hey, they're gone, man. But these women, they got themselves dressed. It wasn't hard to figure out where they were going to take Jesus. Caiaphas Palace. Here they came. And oh, Peter, he's, he's blaspheming. Peter, he's cussing and denying. But these women, they're there. Now they can't go in. They can't do anything. They have no capacity. They're not, they're not doing anything here. They're just locked in. They're just focused. They're just waiting. They're just pulling for him. Just wondering what's happening. What just, just, they, they're just there. They stuck Jesus in a little room. Kept him there all uh, for the rest of the night. And while they caught a nap, now it's the crack of dawn. They're bringing Jesus down the stairway, as we've already described. Hair filled with dried blood, hands tied behind his back. The women are there. Hey, they, they, they can't say anything. They, they can't do anything. They're, there's no way to overthrow this thing. They're just, they're just there. They're just focused. They're just, they're just locked in. They're just, they're just concentrating. They're just pulling for him. They're just with him in this. They're just, whoa, they're just in it. They take Jesus down to Pilate's palace. Hey, they can't do anything about it. These women, no, they're, they're, they're on the outskirts. They're, they're just listening. But, oh, every, every time this, the whip comes down on his back, they're feeling it. They're, 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 they're crying out with the pain themselves. They're, they're empathy and sympathy. And, and they're, they're, they're locked in on him. They're, they're focused. They're, they're, giving, they're giving themselves to him. They're just, they can't do anything. They're just there. They're just locked in. They're just focused. How else do you suppose the disciples knew the details of what happened during all that time? The women told them, no doubt, because the women were just, were just there. They weren't doing anything. They were just, they were just there, just focused, just locked in, just, oh, empathy and sympathy and pulling for him, and hey, they just cared. The women were there. Interesting thing is, we're, we're not into that. <laughs> Just being there, I mean. That's, that's not good enough for us, see. We're, we're people of action, see. We're doers. We're really into the doing thing. See, it's when you do something great that you get the applause, man. It's, it's the doing thing that pulls it off, man. Hey, uh, uh, it isn't just being there that, that anybody applauds. No, it's the, it's the doing something and the performance and, and the pulling it off. See, we're really into that. Because we know if you do really well, then you'll have great results. And if you get great results, then you're really successful. 
And if you're successful, you have high self-esteem. So it's all based upon this, this doing thing, you see. We measure everything by the doing. Hey, we're really, we're really into doing. My, we're into that. Um, you know that our self-esteem is based upon doing, our self-value. Hey, in the, in the male society, uh, where, do, where does a male get his self-worth? How does he know he's valuable? It's because of his job, his career, his, what he does. He, he functions well. He performs good. He really See, if you really want to give your kid good self-esteem, what you need to do is, the minute he's born, put a ball glove in his hand, man. I mean, train him. Teach him. Come on. Let him do it. you got to get him into something that he can really do well. And when he does one thing well, if he really succeeds well, if he really can pull it off, he can really do it great. Then he'll have self-value and he'll be okay in our society. See, it's the kids who can't do anything well. They just sit around and scratch themselves. They're not, they don't, they're not, you know, oh, you know who I'm talking about. See, they don't do well. See, we're really into the doing thing. We measure everything by the doing. Even in Christianity, we measure our righteousness by our doing. See, we count on that. We come up for a healing service, for instance, and I've seen this a dozen times. Uh, some dear saint will be kneeling and will be praying, and, oh, Lord, you know how faithful they've been. Oh, Lord, you know all the work they've done for you. Oh, Lord, you know how many sermons they've preached, how many Sunday school classes they've taught. You know, oh, Lord, how much money they've given. You, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, heal them. It's like it's all based on their doing. Lord, you ought to heal them. Why? Because they've done so much for you now, Lord. See, we're really into the doing thing. Oh, we applaud doing. Hey, that's where success is found. It's in the doing, man. We're really into doing. But these women, <laughs> they were just there. I mean, just focused, just locked in, just, just sympathy and empathy and care and pulling with him. But ladies and gentlemen, wouldn't it be an amazing thing? Think about this. Wouldn't it be an amazing thing if there was a whole other world out there? Wouldn't it be an amazing thing if there was a whole other world out there where the way to get things done was just to be there? You know how it is in our world. <laughs> in our world, the way to get things done is to, man, grab it, kick it, go for it. Hey, get with it, pull it off, do it better, bribe. Hey, get it done, man. You can, hey, go for it. Wouldn't it be something if there's a whole other world where the way to get things done is just be there? Just show up. Just be there. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't it be interesting if there's a whole other world out there, a whole other world out there, where the way to live is to just, it's to die. <laughs> See, you know how it is in our world. The way to live is to go for it. Gusto, man. Drink a lot. Cuss loud. Get with that. Have a big time. Party a lot. Go for it. Live big, man. That's the way it is in our world. But wouldn't it be something if there's a whole other world where the way to live is to die? Dying produces life itself. You know how it is in our world. Hey, in our world, hey, the way to live is to die. The way to, you know how it is in our world. The way to live is to go for it. But this other world, the way to live is to die. Wouldn't it be something if there's a whole other world out there where the way to win is to lose. Wouldn't that be amazing? Isn't that a phenomenal idea? The way to win is to lose? You know how it is in our world. Hey, if you want to win, you, you, you train, you practice, you, you develop your muscles, you develop your skills, and if that doesn't work, bribe the judges. I mean, you got to win. But wouldn't it be something if there's a whole other world out there where the way to win is to lose? How are you doing? I'm losing, man. I'm dying, man. And in dying, and in losing, and in somehow just being there. See, it, it's a whole other world concept. Strange, isn't it? Now, to us, that's absolutely ridiculous. As we view it in our lives, see, that runs contrary to everything we know and everything we're about. Is there any kind of biblical basis for this? Oh, yeah. For instance, let me give you some stories. Uh, there's the story, you know it well, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It's the people of uh, uh, Mount, uh, the Moabites, the people of Mount Seir, and uh, another, great, uh, another great nation, 
they had been whipped, terribly whipped by Israel. And in their defeat, they decided, we're going to put our three armies together. Yeah, we're going to get our three armies together, and we're going to go after Israel, and we're going to fix her good. So three armies joined together, coming after Israel. Uh, the, of course, the scouts uh, realized what was going on, came and reported to King Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. And he got scared to death, as you would uh, suppose. And he declared a fast throughout the land, and they all got on their faces and began to cry out to God. And God told him exactly what to do. He said, here's what I want you to do. Uh, tomorrow morning, bright and early, I want everybody out in the valley. Get everybody out in the valley, all of Israel. And here's how I want you to go about it. I want you to put the singers in front. And then I want you to put the army second. And then I want to put the congregation of Israel last. And you're going to go out to war. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, singers first. What are we going to do, sing them to death? Well, something like that. Here's what's going to happen. The singers of God are going to lock in. They're, they're not going to do anything except just lock in, just focus, just get all wrapped up in, just give themselves to this, this, this singing about the greatness of our God, the singing of the greatness of the holiness of Jehovah. And as they sing, oh, these singers, it'll just catch. The army will begin to catch it. The congregation of Israel in the background will begin to join them in singing. And there'll be this tremendous, overwhelming, just locked in, aren't going to do anything, just locked in, just, you don't have to fight, just lock in, just, 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 and... What a tremendous, strange approach to battle. In fact, let me read you what it actually says. It's a tremendous passage and a great story. Here's, here's what the story says. It says, you, this is uh, chapter uh, 20, verse 17. God said, you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. Hey, you're not going to have to fight. Well, how are we going to win the battle? Well, here's what happened. The singers, army, congregation of Israel, locked in, not doing anything, just locked in, focused on great Jehovah. Hey, they marched towards the enemy, and when they got to the enemy, the enemy got so discouraged, that is, they got so confused, they got so mixed up, they began to kill each other, and when they had all slaughtered all each other, Israel says, well, guess we can go home. Turn around and went back. See, they didn't do anything. They were just there, just focused, just locked in. Man, well, you say, that's the craziest thing I ever heard of. I know. How could that possibly apply to me? Oh, come on. I can think of a dozen ways it applies in my life. Hey, did, did you ever have a battle? Oh, did you ever fight with your wife? Hey, fight with your wife? Yeah, did you win? Well, no. Uh, did you come out on top on that one? Well, absolutely not. I mean, you never win an argument. What are you talking about? You, because even when you win, you lose. Come on. So what did you gain? Well, how am I supposed to handle it? I'm just supposed to lay down and let her walk all over me. Now, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. Why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? Why don't you just try being there? Why don't you just try locking in? Why don't you just try focusing? Why don't you just try try this? Get up in the morning. Go to your job. Just get all wrapped up in Jesus. Just get filled with Jesus. Just lock in on Jesus. Just, oh, lean on him. Respond to him. Give your whole life to him all day long. Oh, just worship him. Just just write a scripture down on a card. Put it in your pocket. Hey, saturate it on it. The greatness of your Jesus and how wonderful he is and what he's doing in your life and how great it all is. And, and come on that night and walk into the kitchen where your wife is and just dump Jesus all over her and see what kind of a difference it makes. Well, it beats what you've been dumping on her. See, it's just, well, I don't fight with my wife. It's my teenager. Your teenager? Yeah, it's that music of his. I hate that music. What'd you do? I told him to turn it down, did he? No, he turned it up. What are you going to do now? I'm going to go into his room, get those CDs and smash them. And you know what he'll do? He'll take your money and go and buy more. So you're not winning on that one, are you? Well, no, no. Well, what do you want me to do? Would you try this? Do nothing. Do nothing? Well, I gotta do something. Why? Could you do nothing? Absolutely nothing. Well, wouldn't it be something if you'd go into that kid's room? Your teenager, you'd go into his room at night. And he's sound asleep, and you'd just go over and put your hand on his forehead and just, 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 
Just pour Jesus all over him. Just, just absolutely focus on Jesus. Just, just, just dump Jesus all over him. Just, wouldn't it be something if he'd go in into his room in the daytime when he's not there? He's off to school and you just fill that room with the presence of Jesus and you just, you just, you just be there, man. Just focus. Just concentrate. Just, what well, would that work? Well, we've tried everything else. We've tried all of our doing. We tried all. We tried everything, but just being there, just focusing, just letting Jesus source this thing. Let, oh, just let me give you another illustration. Uh, this one really moves me. It's the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, you can find it in chapter twenty-six. It's it's right there in chapter twenty-six. And what what a story it is. Uh, it's Thursday evening actually, and and they're in the upper room, and it Lord's Supper goes on and on, and. He institutes a whole new deal and a Passover ceremony and then the Lord's Supper. And now they're headed down for the garden. And as they're going down to the Garden of Gethsemane and all of those things take place, Jesus gets in the garden and hey, eight of them, he leaves eight outside. Judas is gone now to do the betrayal thing. And there's eight of them that are left outside. They are not spiritually to the place they can even get in on this. And he takes the three, the inner core, Peter, James, and John, and says, come with me. And when he gets them inside the garden, well, I want you to see this. It's chapter 26. Look at verse 38. In verse 38, Jesus turns to them. And here's his big concern. He says, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Well, what's he want them to do? Oh, they don't have to do anything. No, they, he's not asking them to, oh, go out and win the world. He's not asking that. He's not, oh, raise some funds to pay the, he's not asking that. He's not asking them, oh, now clean up the church and get ready for the service. Print the bulletin. He's not asking for that. What, what's he asking for? Hey, guys, don't you understand what's going on? My heart is broken. I'm all torn up. Listen, guys, he says. Listen, guys. Hey, all the time I've been with you, you've had lots of problems, you have lot, you've had lots of needs. And you called on me and said, help me, help me, Peter, I remember you. Hey, you were walking on the water, down, yay! And, hey, I came and rescued you. You'd have drowned if I hadn't have, but I came and rescued you. See, I've always been there to help you. I've always been there to meet your need, every single time you had one. Now, guys, I have a need. A personal need. I've never asked you to help me on anything. Never had a personal need that I asked you to help me with. Until now. But I got one now, guys. I'm just all torn up inside. I just feel like the whole weight of, my, of the world is on my shoulders. I feel like I'm facing a brick wall, man. I'm down to it. Hey, I'm just all torn up inside. And listen, guys, I don't want you to do anything. You don't have to say anything brilliant. You don't have to come up with any great ideas. Guys, I'm just... Would you just... Would you just be there guys just watch just watch with me just watch just just be there just put your hand on my back and let me know you're there just 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 come alongside me here just that's all i want just just be there guys isn't it interesting folks that the only time jesus had a personal need and ever asked us to get involved in it was not for us to do something it was for us to be there be there. Just lock in. Just focus. Just, oh. But they didn't. They slept. They slept. They slept. And left him alone. Wouldn't it be interesting if the only thing Jesus has really ever wanted out of you was just for you to be there. Just, just be there, guys. Just Hey, that it wasn't to preach great sermons. It wasn't to do fantastic things. It, it wasn't to, hey, raise lots of money, build the church, take, teach those Sunday school classes, get with the program. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be something if what he's always wanted out of you was, guys, could you just... Uh, could you just be there? I'll do the work, man. I'll spill the resource. It'll all happen. If I'll resource you if you just if you just be there. Could you just could you just be there? Oh, let me give you one more illustration. See, this is all over the scriptures. There's the and you know this story well. There's the Martha thing. Remember the story? Jesus, hey, he's had a lot of ministry going on and needs a day, needs a break, a day off, and hey, uh. Mary and Martha up there at uh, Bethany and Lazarus' house, they got good popcorn, so he decides, I'm going to go up there and spend some time. So he makes it, and of course, when 
like God is. Well, yes, I've heard that. Holy? Well, sure. What's this holiness business? Oh, it's love. God is love. It's all about love. It's the nature of God. It's the very essence, the being of God himself. And that's what he's invited me to become a part of. Friend, isn't that the most exciting thing you've ever heard in your life? That God hasn't offered you to become a part of what he has so he can watch you operate with it. God has literally slid himself down the middle and said, Hey, come on into my heart. Come on into my inner being. Come into what I am in the inside. Come, become a part of what, I, what, what my nature is. Let my very holy, loving nature fill you. And in the fullness of his nature, you will begin to be the expression of who he is in your world. God is love. How could you miss God is love. Now, there's no way to pull that off in a doing sense. I cannot source that. I cannot bring that about. I cannot make that happen. The only chance I've got, he says, is that the God who is love must indwell me. I must become one with him. Who God is must become the very essence of my, uh, uh, of my nature as well. I must know him in that kind of intimacy. And in embracing his, his nature, embracing his person, in embracing the very life of his being, out of me there begins to spill this aggressive kind of action of God. And it isn't the action that I can pull off. It is sourced by God because I am indwelt by the God who is love. Oh, that's the essence of it. Will I give my life to Jesus like that? Will I be indwelt by him like that? Will I let him fill me like that? Is that not the solution? It's not in the doing of lovely things. This is not in the development of loving characteristics. This is not in the development of loving, loving patterns. This is not in new, a new set of rules that will demonstrate love. This is about all. Oh, the nature of God who is love filling me and in the fullness of the nature of God I begin to be an expression of the very essence of who God is do you have that will you seek him for that Jesus we seek you and you alone we're not seeking solution to our problems we're not seeking that we would have more power in order to perform better. What we're after is you. Could you entwell us? Could your nature, could I be bathed in your nature? Could you overwhelm me? Could you encompass me? Could you engulf me with your very self? Please, Jesus, everything that is not of you, I rebuke it. I only want your nature, your being. Oh, I give up the right to do my own thing, to have my own being to express my own personhood. I want you to come and express your personhood through me. God is love. I embrace you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Nature that we can't conceive how we could run a church with nobody doing anything. I mean, I go to pastors and they all say to me, what pastors normally say to me is, well, the big problem around here, I just can't get people to do things. If they just, I can't get them to step up to the plate. If they just do, if they just, and I keep saying, guys, the big problem we've got is we can't get our people not to do. We've got a group of people running around doing this, doing that, doing everything, everything but getting locked in and focused on Jesus. Because somehow, when you get focused on Jesus, supper gets produced. When you get focused on Jesus, 5,000 and besides men besides women and children are fed when you get focused on Jesus battles are won when you get focused on Jesus your world is moved the enemy is defeated when you get focused on Jesus the need of the heavenlies is met and that shakes the earthlies when you get focused on Jesus when you get focused on Jesus something happens inside of you when you get focused on Jesus the world gets won when you get focused on Jesus the church grows when you get focused on Jesus Sunday school classes get taught See, I've discovered when you focus on teaching a Sunday school class, hey, it becomes performance and doing and it's lifeless. When you get focused on Jesus, oh, the wonder of the wonder of his flow begins to take place in the class. And lives are changed. 
It's the great need of the hour. We're so wrapped up in our doing. We're so wrapped up in our doing. We're so, we measure ourselves. We're so full of that. When all the time Jesus is saying, guys, guys, could you just be there? Could you just be there? Be there. Could you just get wrapped up in me? Could you just respond to me? Now, again, you know this would not produce do-nothingism. Oh, if we could get wrapped up in Jesus, things would begin to take place like we've never dreamed in our lives. I need that in my life. The way to live is to die. The way to be free is to be a slave. The way to win is to lose. The way to get things done. Jesus... Oh, we bow before you. We uh, we confess we've really been into the doing stuff for you. I'm so sorry. I should have been into you. But I've been into doing stuff for you. Well, it filled my ego. It made me feel good to accomplish great things for you. And I thought you'd be pleased. But I've missed the concept, haven't I? This is about you. You don't want me to do something for you. You want to do something through me. You don't want me living my life for you. You want to live your life through me. Oh, Jesus, I'm coming after you. Possess me. Possess me, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.